uh, last week, uh, we talked about how Jesus wants to go fishing with you. And we're going to talk a little bit about this week. Jesus is going to show his disciples how you bait the hook or, or you, you cast the net in their case. Uh, how, how do we go fishing for people? And, and what does that look like in Jesus' example for his apostles there? Uh, we studied last week about Jesus called Peter, probably was with his, with, probably with Andrew, and then James and John, uh, all to be his apostles. Uh, he may have met them before, and they were uh, followers of John the Baptist, but it's here where he calls them to leave everything behind, and they leave their business, they leave their earthly priorities to put God first, and uh, they come running to do his will. Today we're going to learn uh, that Jesus really does love you. And the reason we're learning this is, well, for many reasons. One is because it's true. It's what this whole book is about, really, from beginning to end. People say, well, there's a lot of laws in there. There's a lot of rules. Yes, there are. Jesus says, don't play in the street because he loves you. God says, you know, don't tell lies because he loves you. God says, no sex outside of marriage. Why does he say that? Bunch of rules. No, because he loves you. God gives us all these rules even the rules boil down to love. It's all about love from beginning to end. And God knows that if we live our life and die our life rejecting him and go into eternity, that that's a miserable place to be. To be eternally separated from the love of God is a miserable place to be. So God is reaching out to us in love. God loves you. Uh, we human beings have superpowers. And one of our superpowers is the ability to be bored with the most awesome thing possible in the universe. Uh, nothing, I mean, black holes are cool, a quasar would be cool, uh, binary stars orbiting each other, that's cool. Ultra high def TV is cool. Uh, uh, guys, seriously, all these things are marvelous and wonderful, but there's nothing that should awe us, inspire us, drive us to our knees, enrapture us, lift up our hearts, then the reality that the God who made everything, the God who sees everything, including all of our wickedness, this God loves you. He cares for you. Yes, Jesus loves you. And the other reason we keep, we're going to speak about this today, many reasons, is because we tend to lose track of that. Uh, not only do we have a superpower that enables us to yawn while we hear that God would love us enough to die for us on the cross, we, we are not good at prioritizing. And so, bills. God loves me, yeah, but bills. God loves me, but yeah, trouble at work. God loves me, but yeah, my husband burnt the toast and he knows how I feel about that, you know. We're, we're so easily... Uh, I mean, foolishly, it's like we're all a bunch of two-year-olds uh, taken off course and distracted because of, uh, because of things that really can't compare to the love of God. And the other reason we're talking about the love of God is because so often people that, uh, it's hard enough for people that love Jesus to stay connected to that reality, but so often people that don't know God, or maybe they have a, a cultural understanding of God, or they grew up in in church or, or something, uh, but there's really not a relationship there. They lose track or they, or society tells them other things. They have this image of God as, as being eager to just drop another lightning bolt on our heads. That, that God's this mean, ornery old guy and he's looking up there. He's got his lightning bolt ready, you know, it's, it's his trigger fingers itchy and oh, messed up again. Boom, like that, and ooh, ooh, dodging, boom. Yeah. I'm going to get you too, boom, boom. Hey, give me some spare, quick, 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 boom, boom, boom. We've got this idea that, that God is so eager uh, to pour out wrath on us, and the opposite is actually what is true. The Bible says God is, is quick to forgive. He's slow to anger. God loves you, and he wants to help you get your life together. He wants to help you do things his way because his way makes sense. To ignore the will of God, listen, it's, it's stupid. It doesn't make sense. It drives a wedge between us. God still loves us, but we don't experience that love because we're, we're living in a state of denying him, and that's a miserable place to be. Uh, so, yeah, 
We're going to talk about today about the love of God because that's where our faith starts. And we don't grow too old. It's not like we're so mature in our faith that we reach a point where we forget about the love of God. Uh, our Savior doesn't just save because that's his job. Listen, your Savior, he wants to save you because he cares about you personally. It's not just his business. It's not just the thing he does, which it is. That's what God does. He wants to save you from sin, from death, from a life without meaning, from, your, from, from all the trouble you've created in your life. He wants to save you from that because he really loves you, really cares about How much does he love you? Well, enough to die for you. How strong is his love? Well, so strong death couldn't hold it down. This is the God who's saying, come on now, follow me. Does it make any sense to say, thank you for forgiving my sin, but I ain't going to follow you. I love you. Come on, I can lead you to a better place. I ain't going there. Why? You tell me. Why? Doesn't make sense. All right, uh, Luke chapter 5 from uh, verse 12. If you got your Bibles, if you don't, from, uh, where's the sweet spot? From uh, Luke chapter 5 from verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy, or maybe your translation says filled with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground and he begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go, allow uh, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about verse, uh, not going to talk about verse 16 today, so I just want to focus on it right now. Jesus Christ was in the business of loving people but he never became too busy for his relationship with his Heavenly Father. And he would go to a lonely place, he would withdraw, and uh, so he could talk, he could talk with his Heavenly Father, spend some time together with Jesus. And I think that's what's often missing. Uh, I, I go through periods I miss that. I think that's common in our relationship with God to sometimes forget what's truly important. And we need to spend time. Don't don't make church do all the work for you. It's not the way it's supposed to be. You spend time, read your Bible. You spend time, you pray. Enjoy the presence of God. Spend time with God. It's a personal thing. And this, the faith of other people doesn't save us. It's, it's our relationship with God. And, and when trouble comes and we often feel disconnected, isn't it because we weren't really walking all that close before the trouble came? So it's, trouble's going to come. So we really want to make sure that we're walking uh, close with Jesus. Leprosy is a horrible, horrible sickness. And people still get leprosy today. There's still leper colonies. The United States used to have leper colonies. We don't anymore. But can, can you imagine the United States had leper colonies? About, uh, seems less common than it used to. In, in, uh, it's a little confusing because the, the ancient Hebrews used the term leprosy for a number of different skin ailments, uh, from eczema to, to what we would call, I think it's Hansen's disease, which is typical leprosy. Uh, two main forms of leprosy, but there was, there was at least seven or eight different skin diseases that, the, that they, the Jews would just lump all together into the term leprosy. But today, about 250,000 people a year still get leprosy, 250,000. In the United States, 100 people a year. I, I guess in 2009, there was like 250 people. But an average of about 150, 100 people a year uh, get leprosy. Most of them have come to the United States from overseas. But it can take six, seven years for leprosy to show itself. It's a very slow disease. 
And so uh, they may uh, be carrying, they not know it. And then another group of people catch leprosy while they are visiting overseas. And then the third category of people, and this is a good chunk of people, they catch it from playing with armadillos. In Texas and Louisiana, armadillos carry leprosy, so be careful of armadillos. Uh, but today it's, it's treated with, uh, with various medications, and, and most people can live out their entire life if it's caught early uh, on medication. Uh, if it's caught later, you experience uh, damage to your nerves, and then you don't know when things hurt, and you don't realize what a blessing pain is, because it reminds you to take your hand off that hot coffee pot. Uh, but when it damages your nerves, a lot of times people end up losing fingers and toes and whatnot because they're, they're being injured and they don't even know it. They're in pain and they don't even know it. Uh, William Barclay described two kinds of biblical leprosy in this way. It might begin with little nodules which go on to ulcerate. The ulcers develop a foul discharge. The eyebrows fall out. The eyes become vacant and staring. The vocal cords become ulcerated. The voice becomes hoarse. The breath wheezes. The hands and feet always ulcerate. Slowly, the sufferer becomes a mass of ulcerated growths. The average course of that kind of leprosy is nine years. And it ends in mental decay, coma, and ultimately death. The other kind of leprosy, leprosy might begin with the loss of all sensation in some part of the body. The nerve trunks are affected, the muscles waste away, the tendons contract until the hands are like claws. It's a common thing. Uh, the tendons contract so much that people can't stretch out their hands. So when the man came to Jesus with a withered hand, that was probably uh, a form of leprosy. Uh, there follows ulcerations of the hands and feet. Then comes the progressive loss of fingers and toes until the, in the end a whole hand or a whole foot may drop off. The duration of that kind of leprosy is anything from 20 to 30 years. It is a kind of terrible progressive death in which a man dies by inches. In the book of Leviticus, it tells us that a person who develops a certain kind of skin rash would need to be inspected by a priest. And I always thought when I read that, I read it recently too, about the fear, the trepidation. Got to go show this to the priest. Knowing what that entails. If he suspected leprosy, if the priest suspected leprosy, the man would be placed in quarantine for a week. If he wasn't better after that week, he was isolated for another seven days. If he still wasn't better at the end of two weeks, he was exiled out of the community, set outside the camp, outside the city. This is described in Leviticus 13, 45 through 46. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be kept unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean, whenever they see anybody else coming close to them. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. That's Leviticus chapter 13. J. Vernon McGee wrote a short illustration of how this might have played out. One day, a man came in from plowing and said to his wife, I have a little sore on the palm of my hand. It bothers me when I'm plowing. Could you put a poultice on it and wrap it for me? His wife bandaged his hand. The next day, the sore was worse. In a few days, they both became alarmed, and his wife said, you should go to the priest. Imagine how she felt to say that, imagine how he felt. He went to the priest who put him in isolation for 14 days. When he was brought out to the, the priest, looked him over and found the leprosy had spread. The priest told him he was a leper. The heartbroken man said to the priest, let me go to my wife and children and tell them goodbye. The priest replied, you cannot tell them goodbye. You will never be able to take your lovely wife in your arms again. You will never be able to put your arms around those precious children of yours. The man went off alone. His family brought his food to a certain place and then withdrew when he came to get it. In the distance, he could see his wife and observe his children growing day by day. Miserable. Miserable. Loneliness. Le leprosy just wasn't a deadly illness like cancer or like a heart disease. It disfigured you. It made you repulsive. made you look 
bad and smell bad so that everybody would st want to get out of your path and you had to tell them covering your mouth you have to tell unclean I'm unclean not only sick but isolated and lonely no human touch no hug no no arm around your shoulder going back to our reading in Luke a doctor remember dr. Luke he points out two small but significant facts of the event Luke says the man was full of leprosy this wasn't an easy case this wasn't a fresh case this man was full of this disease which was eating away at his skin slowly killing him from the inside out and number two Jesus didn't just say a word to heal him did you catch that Jesus didn't Jesus say from a distance be thou healed he reached out and he touched this man and I imagine you've heard about this good teacher you've heard about this teacher that has this power to to heal and Lord you we fall at his feet and you weep because you know you're filthy you you know you shouldn't be around these this crowd but you come into the crowd you fall at his feet and said Lord if you are willing I know you can heal me and this teacher doesn't just say you're gonna be okay go home but he puts his arm around he puts his hand on him and to be to have this good man to have anybody put a hand on you like that maybe for years he hadn't known human touch imagine what that contact must have been like I'm here with you I see your pain I see your suffering I'm here with you and the next moment he looks down he's totally healed not not just gradually Jesus Christ totally healed him in a moment everything was gone he was brand new and Jesus said now when you get healed according to the Old Testament you got to go and present yourself to the priest so that you can come back into the community make sure you do that do that first because I want to testify to those priests there because he knew the priests didn't like him he knew the priests were going to be against him. I want to testify what's going on. I want them to know what's going on. And he, and he went on his way. Now let's think about this, though. So it's Jesus who loves this guy. Jesus who pours, his, pour, pours out his love on this man, puts, puts his hand on him, says you're healed. But I want you to think about this. Now who told Israel to make people who suffered with leprosy into outcasts? God did. But who is the one who reaches out with love and acceptance? Well, God is. There is no contradiction here. God is the one who sets them in isolation, and God is the one who, 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 uh, who reaches out with love and, and healing and forgiveness. There were health concerns why they were put out of the community. There were cultural concerns why they were put out of the community, and there were religious reasons that God had for setting those who suffered with leprosy outside the camp. Yet it was also God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, who extends love, compassion, and grace. God provides a way back. We may not have very many leper colleagues in the United States, but listen to this. We do have people who consider themselves dirty, who feel like they don't fit in, they feel like they can't be part of the rest of society. People who are looked down upon and shunned by good Christian people. Good Christian people say, we don't want you around our church. We don't want you around our kids. Good Christian people saying, you're outside. People who have sinned and broken God's laws and they are wrong and are, they are suffering for it. God never says you're right. God never says, come back into the community with your leprosy. God never says that their sinful situation is desirable. But who's going to be Christ's hands? Which one of us is going to be Christ's feet to go to these hurting people? Who's going to be his voice? Who's going to put an arm around them and show them love, compassion, and grace and a way back into fellowship with God and with God's people? God is looking for someone who will say, here I am, send me not saying and, and I'm using this as a metaphor right I'm using leprosy as a metaphor for sin not saying that the sin is okay but saying God loves you and there's a way back and Jesus just like that can heal fall at his feet and say Lord if you're willing please cleanse me forgive me I know my situation is rotten I know my situation is nasty Lord God you're my only hope and that person will find grace and forgiveness and mercy immediately. There are plenty of outcasts in this world. They need you. They need love. They need someone to bring them Jesus Christ. 
I, I saw a woman online teaching that the leper's real problem was his negative self-image. And that is what Jesus needed to heal him of, which I can't imagine that the leper would have been pleased with that. <laughs> Come on, perk up. You just have a bad self-image. I don't think you grasp me in the seriousness of the situation. When you know that you're a sinner, when you know you're messed up, it doesn't help for somebody to tell you little fairy tales. You're good. You're good just like you are. You're fine. Just perk up. You need a positive self-attitude. Listen, I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need grace. I need to know someone loves me as I am. I don't need somebody to just ignore what I know is true. I've said nasty things. I've thought nasty things. I've treated people so poorly before. I need forgiveness. I need to be set free. Quit telling me I'm okay. I know better. This woman thought that the leper's real problem was just he was down on himself too much. That could not be farther from the truth. Listen, it was the man's realization of his need that drove him to the feet of Jesus. If he didn't know he was rotting, he wouldn't have come to Jesus. Unless we know we've got darkness on the inside, we're not going to go to the light. Unless we know we're sick on the inside, we won't go to the great physician. He knew he needed help. Before people will see a doctor, they need to know they're sick. Before anybody will come to Jesus, they've got to be sin sick in their souls and say, Lord, I'm morally bankrupt. I've blown it. I'm not who I should be. I need grace. I need forgiveness. And that will drive a person to the feet of God, not telling them you're fine the way you are. We're not fine the way we are. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross because of who we are. We're people who need gut love. We're people who need love despite all the things we've done wrong. Amen? Amen. Despite. Another thing I want us to notice here is this man's beautiful, beautiful prayer. He comes right at the foot of God and said, Lord, I, you know, I, this idea of belonging, ma, my master, my, you, my, you owe me. Lord, if you are willing, according to your will, if it's okay, if, if you find this within yourself, if, if it's according to your grace, Lord, according to your will, please make me clean. This prayer is similar to the one that Jesus himself is going to pray a few years later. A few years later, Jesus is going to pray a very similar prayer to the one he heard prayed to him from this leper just prior to going to the cross in Luke 22, verse 42. Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. We were talking about this, uh, this false theology, this name it, claim it, blab it and grab it. We were talking about this in our Wednesday leadership meeting. Notice, notice what Jesus didn't do. Jesus did not say, Father, I know that you teach us that a double-minded man will never receive from you, so I declare that you are a God of his word. In the name of myself, I will take this cup from me. I claim that it is already gone. I'm speaking a word of faith that I no longer have to have this cup because to do so would be doubt, and you're only pleased with faith. So in my name, this cup is gone. It is already gone yesterday. Said no Jesus ever. Amen. That's not the way Jesus ever spoke. And that's not the way the, the leper spoke here. Jesus never came demanding from the Father. And it wasn't the way that we're taught to pray by Jesus. Jesus doesn't teach us to pray like that. If the blab it and grab it was true, don't you think Jesus would have taught us to do it? And it wasn't what the leprous man said to Jesus. Instead, they petitioned him with true faith, a faith that trusts. I'm putting my trust in you. If you are willing, then please grant my request. But not my will, but your will be done. And isn't that beautiful? That's true faith. Not saying, God, you better give this to me, and if you don't, I'm not happy with you. That's... Or maybe if God doesn't give it to you, you feel like, oh, man, I'm miserable. I don't have enough faith. God doesn't love me. God's not going to... That's not trusting God. God says, I love you. Trust it. Believe it. Now, go before the Heavenly Father with your prayers, with complete confidence. It lay it at His feet and says, Lord, if this is your will, please bless me in this way. Father, please heal me. Father, please grant me this. Please help me with that. 
Going to God with trust. Trust means that if God says no, I still love him anyways. Trust means that I'm going to hold on whether he answered the prayer the way I wanted to or not. That's real trust. Not saying that he has to do things my way. That's dictating. That's treating God like a Coke machine, like a cosmic Coke machine, pushing the right button, saying the right prayer, and I get what I want. Where's the love relationship and where's trusting there? There is no trust there. If you're willing, Lord, please. I know you have a better perspective on this for me, but Lord, I feel like I feel like this is what I need, Father. Please, coming to God, trusting God, and then leaving the results to Him. Laying it at His feet means we put it there and we step back. We don't demand. I want to see a whole church full of trust, trusting people. We trust the Lord. We're filled with the joy of the Lord because we give it to God and we trust Him. We give it to God and we believe in Him. We believe just the way a little kid trusts his dad when his dad's driving the car, just the way a little kid trusts his mama when he sits on his mama's lap and, 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 and she shovels this weird green goo into his mouth. Okay, Mom, I guess. Do we trust our Father in Heaven enough to let Him drive the car? Do we trust our Father in Heaven enough that when life doesn't go where we want to go, that He still knows what's right? It wasn't just me using sin, uh, leprosy as a metaphor for sin. The Bible also uses leprosy as a metaphor for sin. That's in the Old Testament. Remember when you sacrificed an animal, it had to be pure, it had to be spotless. Couldn't have a broken leg, couldn't have an ulcer on it, couldn't have uh, any sickness because one is you, you always give God your first fruits, you give your best to the Lord. But, but the other reason was is because it was symbolic of holiness, of purity. That's why Jesus Christ is called the spotless Lamb of God. He doesn't, it wasn't that his, he never had a pimple, okay? It wasn't that, that, that he, he never had a rash when he, when, he, when he was wiping poison ivy on his face or whatever. I don't know why he would do that. But, yeah, rode the donkey. There, there's a thought. So, <laughs> uh, in the Bible, leprosy is also seen as something that, it, it's a physical example of how our sin spiritually separates us from God. A person with a skin rash was considered unclean and could not take place in community worship, couldn't come into the tabernacle or lay to the temple. By contrast, Christ is the spotless lamb without blemish, meaning without sin. Not that sickness made somebody more sinful, that's not true. But that the disease was a visible illustration of a spiritual reality. Sin separates us from unity. Sin separates us from community with God and with other people. Sin always drives a wedge between a husband and wife, between friends, between people in a church. You let bitterness grow towards the person who sits over there, towards the person who sits in front of you over there, towards the worship team, towards the person who does announcements. You let bitterness grow, I guarantee you, the devil will have a foothold in your life. Sin separates. Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ draws us together. Sin rots our souls. And don't think we can get away with it and there's no consequences, as Brother Jerry was saying in Sunday school class. It numbs our feelings. It desensitizes us to what can hurt us. What can spiritually kill us? Sin in those days could not be cured. Uh, sin, leprosy in those days could not be cured by human effort. Sin still cannot be cured by human effort. In the end, sin leaves us spiritually dead. It's destroyed our mind, and it leaves us all alone. But Jesus offers us a way back home. Jesus puts his hand on our shoulder. As soon as we come to him in faith with tears, Lord, I've messed up so bad. Please forgive me. Instantly, like that. That was better. This finger I broke a long time ago. It doesn't snap as well. Uh, Jesus, uh, in the moment that the leper came to him, said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In that moment, when we come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm unclean. Please forgive, Lord. In that moment, Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus covered us. It, the Bible says it washes us of all our imperfections, of all of our impurity. We are washed by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. Just like the, the spotless lamb in the Old Testament uh, was symbolic. It was, he, was, he was a pre-echo. What is that word used? Uh, he was an archetype, or Jesus is an archetype, uh, whatever. Anyways, the lamb was supposed to represent what would happen later with Jesus. And when the lamb was sacrificed in the temple, that blood 
uh, took away the sins, but it, was, it really wasn't the blood of the Lamb. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that was echoing forward or backwards in time. Uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ, his perfect blood is the spotless Lamb of God. When Remember when, when John the Baptist saw Jesus for the first time, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was him saying, he's a walking dead man. He's going to die for our sins. But he's perfect, and his blood will cover all of our sins. Jesus provides us a way back. And brothers and sisters, when we're feeling miserable, when we're feeling beat up, when we're feeling like we never do anything right, Jesus Christ is right there to put his arm around us and said, I am willing to bring you back. Have you ever felt so stupid? Have you ever felt so ugly that nobody cares, that nobody wants to look at you? Have you ever felt so sinful that if people really knew what had happened in your life or really knew what goes on in your mind, that no one would love you or care about you? Has life ever been so horrible that you feel like you're caught in a downward spiral and there's no escape, that nothing ever goes right, no one cares, not really, and there's no hope at the end of the tunnel? People don't really seem that interested. People misunderstand you all the time, and deep inside, you kind of don't blame them because you can't stand yourself either. You feel unloved. You feel unworthy of love. You think you're so messed up that you've messed up so many times. That fact that it's harder to do right than to do wrong. You've done too many nasty things, hurt too many people around you. Who would love you? Certainly not perfect God. Lord, don't look at me. I'm a wicked man. Just like Peter said, Lord, go away from me. I'm messed up. What did Jesus do? He said, no, I'm not going away from you. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You follow me now. This leper who for years, every he went, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm messed up. And everybody would go, and they'd get away from him. People would scatter. People would take their children and move them away. For, and he falls at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord. And Jesus says, I'm willing to forgive. I accept you. Be healed. I hope everybody in this church Everybody catches this on the internet or television. I hope you know. I hope you know Jesus is good. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you just as you are. You're not too nasty. You've not done something so wrong that he won't put his hand on you. Fall at his feet. Confess your sins. He's a good God. Don't hide from this love. Don't run away from this love. <clears throat> Imagine the poor leper if he had run away from Jesus instead of running to Jesus. I want to see Jesus as he really is. I want to see this Jesus. I want everybody in our church to know this Jesus, the Jesus who, who is showing his apostles. I'll make you fishers of men and hear how you do it. You love people. You love people when nobody else will love them. You love people when they can't even stand themselves. I want you, brothers and sisters, to see your Savior who is willing to heal, willing to heal the worst in us, who loves you, who reaches out to touch you when no one else will, who understands, no one understands, Jesus understands. No one cares, Jesus cares. And your sin, your sin, and you know it, has never made you so filthy, so worthless, so repulsive that Jesus wouldn't love to see you, wouldn't love to see you this moment, wouldn't love to put his arm around you, comfort you with... <laughs> comfort you pour out his forgiveness on you the moment you reach out to him trusting in his goodness trust Jesus' love what kind of love are you going to trust if you don't trust this love hebrews eleven six 6 says without faith it's impossible to please god jesus loves you do you have enough faith to believe it jesus wants to accept you just as you are do you believe it Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he will reward anyone who earnestly seeks him. Brothers and sisters, do not doubt God's love. Trust him. Hold on tight. He sees. He cares. And remember, with Jesus, all things are possible. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, 
Father, thank you for always listening to our prayers, and thank you, God, for not always answering the way we wanted them answered. Lord, we all know we've asked for things in the past that we're so glad we don't have now. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to trust your love. And Father, I pray that we will, two things, Lord, I pray that we will be your hands, your feet, your voice, that you change our hearts, Lord. Give us a love. Give us compassion. Give us a grace to actually care about people that the world rejects. Give us grace and love to draw people close to you, Lord, that maybe can't even stand themselves. And Lord, I pray that you also help us to find our, our acceptance in you, Lord, so that we're not demanding that others treat us just a certain way, that we're not easily offended, Lord, that we, we don't expect other people to be Jesus for us, Lord. But please, Father, for myself, for my brothers here, for my sisters here, for this church, Lord God, please help us to be enraptured with who you are, help us to love your grace, and then, Lord, help us to take that grace and give it to other people. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.org. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.